Ann's uh, got software, Kevin's got the hard assets. Um, let's get right to it. Uh, supply chains got really messed up when COVID hit a couple of years ago. Uh, what's your view on the current state of, of the global supply chain and the, and the North American one? How, how troubled are they now? And where, where are the problems? Well, maybe I'll jump in first and then hand it over to Kevin. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us today. I think you know I'm a, a lifelong supply chain practitioner before I joined uh, the software side of the fence. And uh, it's been a really fascinating time to be in this seat because really we are in a state of constant disruption. If there's anything that I hear articulated over and over again, that the only constant is change. The disruptions seem to be cascading um, and I don't expect us to see that normalization really come back anytime soon. I think this notion of having a supply chain that can be robust to disruption is going to be one of the top priorities for organizations come going forward because we still are going to be in this dynamic state of over availability and under availability for several months to come. Kevin? Yeah, what I yeah, what I would add to that is I completely agree. Um, I'll throw a couple of statistics at you um, that put the pandemic and e-commerce in a in a context. It took 25 years effectively for Amazon to build up its portfolio, 200 million square feet, something like that. And they doubled it in, in two years, 2020 and 2021. So a massive amount of uptake of space over two years, over 200 million, almost 250 million feet in, in two years. And I don't think anyone in our sector thought that that was sustainable or, or healthy, frankly, for the sector. And then we went through these massive supply chain disruptions where, you know, a container from Asia went from costing companies $6,000 to $30,000 in February of 2021. So that has started to really calm down, but also so has the activity of companies like Amazon um, in, in our sector in, in real estate. So that has calmed down. But what's replaced that is companies now are looking to build resiliency into their supply chains. So this sort of just-in-time delivery system has not, hasn't been replaced, certainly. Um, efficiency is all, always the name of the game. But we're seeing tenants like Amazon and others that are taking more space, 5 to 10% more space they're carrying as inventory now to basically guard against future disruptions because, to the earlier point, they're expecting it. They're expecting it to happen in today's world. So, and Conexus is, is one of those tech companies that has not really experienced a slowdown um, lately. In fact, you've had really rapid growth uh, since the pandemic hit. Uh, take us into your seat. How has uh, the event of COVID-19 and the things that, that have followed it um, changed how your clients and how companies think about you know, the flow of goods? What are some of the specifics? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good question. You know, one of the differentiators for Canaxis is our approach to supply chain. This is a software company that was purpose built for supply chain from day one. And our philosophy and technique really focuses on, you know, reducing the latency across the supply chain. So when we talk about resilience, a supply, a resilient supply chain, we're really the perspective on that is really as an outcome. Right? We want a, a resilient. And one of the ways is exactly what Kevin mentioned around additional inventory making yourselves you know, a bit heavier in places where you think you might need that buffer. Another way is by having better information and knowing about changes of, you know, as they're happening or as quickly as possible so that you can react. And that's what you know, Canaxis Rapid Response has done since day one, this ability to have that transparency from your end-to-end -end supply chain know what's going to happen and make changes and adjustments in your plan so that you are able to respond as quickly as possible. So that's what we're seeing because the disruptions are constant, because the supply lane that was there is gone, because the raw material is no longer there. What do you do about it? And the sooner you can know about that, the sooner you can react to it. And uh, our, our, you know, quite frankly, we're getting a, many, many knocks at the door to say, help, we have a, a, have a challenge right now, we need to get through, and then we want to future-proof our supply chain for this notion of constant disruption. Kevin, I, I want to uh, 
turn to uh, to you and the situation in the sort of warehouse and industrial sector. But first, uh, I mean, your company has been completely transformed over the past decade. It was essentially a single purpose company to, to uh, be a landlord to Magna International. Now it's uh, diversified, totally changed changed its business model. Maybe you could just take our audience a little bit through that and, and where you're going next. Yeah, it's a great segue into, into our story. And you're right, we were born out of Magna International when they split out their, their real estate and their, their gaming assets. I think we became a REIT in 2012. <clears throat> and at that time, we were 97% Magna uh, facilities. And here we are today, where by GLA, we're, we're around 20% and that continues to fall. So we've really moved strongly into e-commerce and logistics. That now represents over 75% of our company. And that transformation continues. I, I think the only, the other thing that I would add is uh, in 2021, we've always been active on the development side, but we made a much bigger play and enhanced our development program in 2021. So now we're beginning to control the quality and location of assets a bit better in our facilities. It allows us to target certain markets that we have a lot of conviction in, and it allows us to control the quality of assets that we're we're putting into, into our portfolios. What's an example of markets where you have a lot of conviction? Um, well, the, everybody knows about the LAs of the world, et cetera, uh, and, and that makes complete sense. But where we've put a lot of where we focus a lot of our attention is markets that are beginning to emerge in the supply chain, like the Eastern seaboard. So think of markets like Savannah, which we think because of the widening of the Panama Canal and their ability to take the, the, the super tankers and other large ships, a lot of companies are, again, building resiliency and redundancy into their supply chains. And a lot of them are shifting those uh, transportation corridors to the East Coast. So if you look at our portfolio in the U.S., because it's probably the easiest thing for people to understand from a supply chain perspective, is a lot of our uh, assets are located in the sort of e-commerce corridor in the U.S. So think from the port of Houston through Dallas, through the Midwest, and into Pennsylvania in the Northeast. That's where a lot of our portfolio in the U.S. is. And also now we're adding those strategic markets such as Savannah and Atlanta, that are really important supply chain hubs for the East Coast of the United States. So we've seen in, uh, in the past couple of years, extremely tight uh, industrial markets, uh, very little you know, warehouse space, for example, in certain places, uh, you know, Vancouver's very tight, uh, Toronto to name a couple of places. Uh, Kevin, how, how long will that continue? Will, will that continue and, and, and why or why not? Well, I think there was a lot in the news, and certainly if you look at our, our stock price, it was hit by it. There was a lot in the news made by Amazon's comments about giving back space and, uh, and, and maybe um, canceling some of their development projects. But certainly that has not hurt the overall sector. Q2 was one of the strongest quarters we've seen globally. Uh, rents are up almost 5% quarter over quarter, and they're up 15% year over year in the US alone and almost 10% in the markets that we're in in the Netherlands and Germany. So it continues to be very strong as maybe Amazon takes up less space moving forward for the next couple of years, but that has been replaced in terms of demand by, by other companies that continue to build out their e-commerce and their omni-channel uh, supply chains. So for the foreseeable future, it looks good. I mean, obviously, we can't look that far into the future, what happens five years from now, 10 years from now. And we do have probably a more balanced um, market right now. Um, but, you know, when we look at the activity we're getting on our development side, our leasing spreads, we have almost 10 million fee rolling next year. And we feel we're probably 20% below market in terms of rents. And just based on where market rent growth is 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 going, we think 2023 and 2024 at least are going to be very strong years. And what's um, what's an illustration of of uh, you know of how a, a, a company might use what you guys provide to to do do supply chain uh, management differently than maybe they would have a couple of years ago. Sure. I mean, it really is this notion of how do you understand what's going on faster? How can you take advantage of 
maybe dual sources of, of raw material availability or alternate transportation lanes. Um, you know, I think as you and I were, were preparing for this call, we spoke a lot about digital twins. And that's something that's really become more pervasive lately. It gives an, a company an opportunity to try out different scenarios and to almost prepare for different risks materializing and making decisions on what would be the best course of action for their supply chain. Should they consider alternate sources? Should they consider alternate transportation lanes? Should they consider alternate manufacturing, quite frankly? And um, that's that notion of being able to consider all these things and then actually consider them in real time um, through a, a process known as concurrent planning is the ability for a company really to see what options and what should they do right in this moment to be able to mitigate the challenges they're facing. I'd like to ask you both about uh, nearshoring and reshoring, which you know has been talked about a lot. Uh, first, in the context of uh, you know trade agreement disruptions, if you will, during the Trump years, and then and then and then subsequently because of the pandemic. Uh, so how real is that? Um, what does it look like so far? And maybe we'll we'll start with you on that question. I think there was a lot of enthusiasm around the idea of reshoring or nearshoring, particularly through the early days of the pandemic, as people were very challenged to get their, their materials and their product to market. Um, I think as we progress through in, in more recent times, there was a realization that while understanding dual sourcing and opportunities for different different places to, to identify uh, materials. Uh, the reality is that there's not necessarily the skill, the, the availability of space, the, you know, even the, the governmental regulations that would allow certain types of manufacturing, certain types of production near or shore. And while you do see examples like TMSC making a large investment in facility in, in Phoenix to ensure that there's greater availability of chips, I think they're more the exception than the rule. Kevin? Yeah, I, th I think there has been a, a few changes, a few observations I would have, and I think it's different in our jurisdictions, i.e. North America and Europe, and there are differences between the U.S. and Canada, and I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the biggest things that e-commerce did um, is that tenants now rely so much more on labor and labor availability than they did before. And we, we saw that but even before the pandemic, where e-commerce providers such as Amazon and others were targeting markets where labor was, was available. And we've seen that very much in Europe. And I think the, the additional disruption in Europe, which has changed the thinking somewhat, and this gets back to onshoring, is there are uh, tenants that we have that had large footprints in Eastern Europe, and now that is changing. And we are seeing them begin to retrench to their markets in Western Europe, which are, which are more democratic, which would be a clumsy way to put it, but I think you, you know what I'm trying to say. And then we look at Canada, uh, where we have a large development in Brantford, and a lot of our activity were companies that because of tariffs, whether they are newer tariffs that were put in by the US a few years ago, or the older tariffs, a lot of them need to be in these markets to supply Canadian uh, markets in Canadian cities, cities. So certainly we've seen that. And in our experience in the US through our development program is we absolutely are seeing manufacturers come to the US. And I think that that's going to continue. I think the recent announcement by the Biden administration that electric vehicles, most of them to achieve the um, the incentives, most of them need, most of the parts need to be manufactured and made in the U.S. We're certainly seeing that uh, impact on, on our portfolio and, and on the leasing prospects that we're running into there. We have one in Tennessee, in Nashville, as a matter of fact, where um, we had a lot of prospects, we had a lot of interest in that space, and a number of them were new manufacturers to that market. Uh, just on the on the retrenchment in Europe from from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, was that um, uh, did that accelerate on uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, or was it already happening prior to that? No, I, I think I think that was a major catalyst, and, and I think that we've seen even through Asia too. I, I think what we're seeing is supply chain shifting somewhat, where our tenants are are looking at alternative ways instead of coming just from China, and that. 
would be more because of the COVID related issues that they're having. They're starting, they're trying to find more resiliency and they're finding it easier to do in Western European countries and Western European markets. One of the great disruptions you know, to the broader economy that we're facing right now, obviously, is the, the related issues of inflation and then the energy crunch in Europe. Uh, maybe you could each give us briefly a, a, uh, a view on how your companies are, are dealing with the inflation problem. Do you want, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, it, I think it's a problem for everybody. And as I said before, uh, and this is certainly the, the um, what's happening in the Ukraine is having an impact on, on the labor market. That has been the single, single biggest issue that we see our tenants dealing with is the availability of labor and the cost of labor. And so they're feeling like I think everybody else has. And a number of our leases in Europe are CPI indexed. And so that's another um, cost issue that, that they will be facing. Whereas in North America, it's much more common to have fixed rent escalations. And so they won't be as impacted on the rent side as they will in Europe, which are facing CPI indexed uh, uh, annual rent escalations. I'm not sure from our seat, we're seeing a big shift. If anything, there's still a continued desire for supply chain transformation to become more efficient and effective um, given the current circumstances, to be more thoughtful about inventory investments and, um, uh, and, and figuring out how to, again, best mitigate challenges so they don't cause big disruptions to uh, company performance. So um, we're continuing to, you know, our, our team that goes out to showcase, to demo, and have conversations with prospects really are busier than ever because there is that continued interest in what do I do to make sure that whether it's inflation situations or another massive crisis that uh, they're able to mitigate. Now, the comment around talent, every single customer is asking us about talent. Where do we find the talent? What kind of talent? What do we need to make sure that we're in the best position to leverage these capabilities in a way that will deliver? And just to finish um, that point, uh, it is still about efficiency. And although we're seeing tenants dealing with cost pressures, they're still looking to take up modern space and really enhance and modernize um, their supply chain capabilities. We're absolutely seeing that. So it seems a little bit contrary that in this environment, people are looking to grow, but the fact is they're looking to grow and become more efficient. And when you look at it in the US that has the most modern warehouse um, network in the world, the average warehouse is still 40 years of age in the US. And, and that, as that's changing, tenants are able to now modernize their operations and, and become more efficient. So they're still looking to grow, particularly in, in the modern logistics uh, types of space. Kevin, I imagine you're seeing as we are that that in, involves a lot of automation and that whether you're automating through, you know, advanced analytics and AI in your systems or whether you're taking that into warehousing automation, that's that's a way to drive that efficiency, maybe in a way that's a little more controllable. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think it's one of the really encouraging things for our sector is if you look back 20 years ago, you'd have a large warehouse, maybe five people driving forklifts. Today, you could have thousands of workers in there. You have like fulfillment centers with uh, Amazon and others. The newer ones are five stories. And three of those levels are, are robots only. So the amount of investment behind the door that tenants are making today in these is worth more than the building itself. And, and that's that's great for our sector, just to see this level of investment, automation, and mechanization behind these buildings. They are not just, you know, you, this, this isn't your daddy's warehouse anymore. We're almost out of time, but just one last question uh, really quickly in the minute we have remaining. Uh, for each of you, what do you see as the biggest risk to the supply chain in the near term, and what's the greatest opportunity in your sector? And we'll start with you. That's a, that's a great question. I think the biggest risk is for companies to do nothing 
because they will not survive. What got them here over the last 30, 30 years will not get you through the next three. And we hear that again and again. So doing nothing, just trying to ride it out, that's, that is the individual biggest risk to your supply chain. Opportunity is to take a chance, explore these new technologies, techniques, capabilities that are available, look at your processes and 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 take advantage the the capabilities technologies interest in supply chain is at a different level than it has been before and if you allow that supply chain to be part of your strategic fabric for your organization and allow it to grow to the next level that's actually going to let organizations really see themselves blossom because it, it's you know, the supply chain is the last organization that touches your product capability or service before it encounters the customer. And as a result, it has the richest amount of information. Take advantage of that, it'll allow you to grow. Kevin, risk and opportunity? Yeah, I think the risk has been the over-reliance on maybe cheaper labor uh, in the East and, and single supply routes. Uh, and certainly we're seeing the impact on, on our tenants and, and on business. And I think the opportunity is, is the other side of that, is the, the tendency now for tenants to build resiliency into their supply chains, having options and redundancy. And that's obviously good for our sector because in the end, they will need, they will need more space. But uh, the days of relying on just the port of Los Angeles uh, or you know a, a rail route from China to, to Poland, I think that those days are, are over. Uh, and but that's the opportunity for us as well as people begin to build out the supply chains and and, and reach maturity.